Right, thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Anton Teo, for having me here. Uh, so this is the School on Transport, and I will not talk about transport, but I assume that we agreed on that beforehand. I actually checked with the organizers. So the other thing is I'd like to thank the organizers to actually schedule my lecture at about 1 a.m. of my local time, uh, which is, uh, which as I found out today, they did on purpose because they want me to slow down. So I should be actually slow today. So uh, I also, also want to issue one correction. I actually never got the Czech PhD. They uh, messed up with the paperwork, and uh, about five years after I uh, actually defended the thesis in the Netherlands under the joint agreement between the Czech and uh, Dutch uh, side, they kicked me out of school. <laughs> <laughs> so one disadvantage is those years will not count against my retirement. But we will not uh, have any retirement money anyway uh, when we retire. Okay, so I want to talk about the Gaussian free field, and in fact, mostly about the discrete Gaussian free field. And this is a buzzword that whether you work in uh, this part of probability or not, you probably have heard anyway. It's kind of been coming on in various reincarnations uh, over the last decade. And so the purpose of this lecture is to sort of, you know, equalize what we know and what we don't know in this audience, because I don't know you, you don't know me, and I don't know what you know. And so uh, what I'll try to do is to actually, you know, give you some overview what uh, sort of the main things are, give you the definitions, give you sort of the, the, the broader perspective of the field, and gradually kind of funnel the attention to this very uh, pr pretty narrow uh, direction, which is the extreme values of the Gaussian, of this Gaussian field which uh, I've had some pleasure to work on with uh, Oren Luidor uh, from Haifa, currently. Okay, so let me start with definitions. Okay, and I'll give you several definitions, so you can think of the first definition as a real definition, and the others as sort of uh, indications of theorems. So you can define Gaussian free field, discrete Gaussian free field, with respect to any discrete state Markov chain, okay? That's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the larger area. But I will focus on a specific case where that Markov chain is the simple random walk on the d-dimensional hypercubic lattice. So my play field will be Zd, and I'll later set, very soon actually, later set D equals to 2, and I'll take a D, which is a subset of Zd, which is finite. And then I define a measure. Okay, and then I actually I give you a configuration. I give a configuration Hx uh, given uh, for every x not in D. So we'll think of this as a boundary condition. I want to talk about the boundary values, even though later on I'm going to set them pretty uh, regularly to zero. And uh, I'll now define a measure uh, on on the, all of those fields, well, actually on fields in the whole ZD, but the measure will be kind of trivial. So there is some normalization, which I will let you figure out what it is. And then there is e to the minus, let me write this as e of h, uh, product e, uh, you know, so I'll have a Lebesgue measure in here, and then I'll have, outside, I'll have a product of uh, Dirac masses at the value hx. So let's first look at this measure. So this measure, it's a, it's a really a finite dimensional measure because outside the, the set D, I just take a product of deltas. So this simply freezes the configuration to the value h bar outside. And that's for the purposes that my E will depend on both values. So I want to write it this way. And here I have a Lebesgue measure. So this is the radon Nikodim derivative with respect to that. And the E of h, I'm going to first let me write you a formula. So this is now a function on, on H's, on H's in, uh, in the whole space. So I'll just write it in this way. So it's a sum over x, y, and z, d. Actually, uh, let me not write it like this. Let me write it in uh, d uh, union, the boundary of d. So the boundary of d will denote the set of vertices on the immediate outside of the, uh, of the set d. Uh, and I'll write h, x, minus h y squared. And now there, there will be a mysterious constant, which I'll write as 1 over 4 d in here. OK. So that's the, uh, 
that's the uh, that's the definition. Okay. So this uh, you know because the, uh, the, e the this function is quadratic in the H's, this is exponential of a quadratic function in, in the H's. So this is a Gaussian measure. Okay. So this is a Gaussian measure. And the normalization is obtained by, you know, by, re by representing this, such as I will do uh, in a moment, I'll representing this as a Dirichlet, you know, as a Dirichlet-like form object, as the inner product of H with minus Laplacian on H, and uh, then you get the determinant of the Laplacian square root of that in here, and, and a bunch of two pi's, okay? So this is sort of the definition of this Gaussian measure that I'll consider. Now let me give you a picture that, you know, so, so there are many interpretations of this, and the reason why I write that is because it actually represents one interpretation. Now you can, you can in fact play with this E of H, you can think of this as an energy of a configuration, which is associated to this particular, so maybe if I want to really, uh, you know, make it be specific, so this will be energy of a configuration, including the boundary values, okay? And the energy is such that it's minimized when these values are sm the smallest. Now, if your boundary values are zero, the minimum of the energy is everybody is zero. Okay, that's why h equals zero. If your boundary values are restrictions of a linear function, then the minimum values are actually uh, linear in uh, in the position, and there are the, the interpolation of the linear values in there. Okay, and in general, if you take uh, any boundary values, then the minimizer of this energy is exactly the discrete harmonic function which extends the boundary values uh, inside the domain. Okay, so note that the minimum of EH over H equals H bar on the boundary of D is uh, realized uh, by, by the harmonic, by the harmonic function, by the harmonic, uh, I should say discrete harmonic maybe. Is there an eraser so that I don't uh, make these smears on the board like that? Actually, this will uh, be, be a moment of truth. Discrete. This discrete uh, harmonic uh, extension of the boundary of H bar into D. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, this is of course. Yeah. I forgot to write this. Okay, so it's for the it's for the pair, and you know, so this this will generically denote the Euclidean distance in my uh, in my setting, and this is even true on the lattice. So I take pairs of x and y's which lie in D and and the boundary of D, and then I uh, uh, and then I divide, you know, and then I restrict them to one. And I, I realize there's another error because you know there's overcounting. I have to uh, actually let me uh, let me do it differently. Let me write it in this form. Uh, you know these are, in, and I'll give you uh, you know further notation. B of D is the edges uh, with a one endpoint in D. Okay, so. So what I have is that I have the lattice, and for every pair of nearest neighbors in the lattice, I call this an edge, and these are unordered edges, so undirected. Okay, so each edge gets counted only once, and then this constant is correct. If I uh, do, if I'd write it the way I wrote it before, then it will be some symmetrization that I would have to do. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, okay, um, don't make me worry. So, so this, this constant is a subset, sub, subject to some doubts. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> I'll fix this constant. If, if, if it's uh, incorrect, I'll tell you. Uh, I just need to figure out, okay? So, all right, so so th that you know, so that's that's the picture that you want to have in mind is that the minimum of the energy is in there, and so it actually turns out that that you know, so this describes a field which you know where the minimizer is given, it's some you know given function, 
and then this this describes uh, you know the, the sort of the statistical mechanical picture around this is where fluctuations around this minimum is allowed. Okay, and it's weighted by some exponential time. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the Gaussian object. Okay, and so uh, so let me uh, you know let me write one lemma. Okay, so so this will be so. What what I'll do is that I'll define, you know, associated with the uh, with this uh, with this uh, 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 you know form is the uh, is the green function. I mean, with the simple random walk is the green function. So let me define g d x y to be the expectation of sum of k from one up to tau d complement uh, of. Uh, 1 over x, y equals uh, y, x, uh, k equals y, where x is the simple random walk, and tau d complement is the infimum over k larger than 0, such that x, k is in d complement. Okay? So this is the, uh, this is the expected number of times that a walk started at x visits y before exiting from the domain d. Okay, so this is the green function. So maybe I should write the lemma for four. Okay, and uh, so here is the statement. So if uh, if h is distributed according to the mu d h bar, uh, then the expectation of h x is the expectation of uh, whether this is the expectation with respect to the random walk of the value of the boundary at the hitting point of the complement and the covariance of hx hy is the gd of xy okay Okay, so I, I've decided that along this, uh, al particularly along this sort of first part of the of the lecture, I'll be sort of dropping various calculations on you that you can check or uh, or not if you want. And so this is one thing that you can check based on this uh, based on this definition. No, no, no. So the, the the covariance is of course independent of the green function. That the covariance is independent of the boundary values. Right. So 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 the point is that uh, you know so a typical way to prescribe a Gaussian this is a multivariate Gaussian uh, vector. Of, you know the distribution on R to the cardinality of d, and that can be described uniquely by prescribing the uh, the expectation and the covariance. Okay. So if you don't like this specific definition, I can give you that. But that, you know, this would be quite natural, but this somehow is less. And that's why I prefer to actually give you that definition first and then, you know, use it as a Dirac property. Now, if I, if I were to talk only about the zero boundary values, then I would, in fact, start in here. I would just, you know, because this line would be trivial and then and, and this definition is kind of more compact. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry? Fine, any question is allowed, unless it's completely personal. <laughs> okay, so this is something that you can check, okay? And so, okay, so why is, let me give you an indication why this is true. I already told you that uh, the expectation is, sorry, that the minimizer of the energy is exactly the discrete harmonic function, okay? And this is sort of how it will work in with this with this particular quadratic form is that the minimizer of the energy will be in fact the expectation, okay, in here. So this is uh, and once you subtract this from this this expectation from the and this you know and this is harmonic because this is the solution of the Dirichlet problem by the random walk method, okay. And if I subtract this value from h, what I get is that I get a centered Gaussian field because now the expectation is zero, and for centered Gaussian field, e of h has a particular form. So this is, you know, for you to note that 
if the h is zero on the complement, then e of h has the form, so you can sort of open up this uh, square, write it as, a, as an inner product, and in fact commute one of the gradients onto the other side, and you can write this as, uh, as h minus the uh, Laplacian of h. Okay, on, I guess, you know, now on L2, uh, it's on L2ZD, but it's also on L2D, if you want. Okay, and uh, then this, you know, so then your, then your Gaussian field is of the form H, the covariance to minus 1H, so that tells you that the covariance is the inverse of the minus Laplacian on the space of L2 functions which vanish outside the so this tells you that uh, the covariance, the covariance, uh, uh, I guess the C, which is the covariance of H, is equal to the minus Laplacian of inverse on L2, on L2D. And uh, the green function is exactly the, uh, the inverse of the generator of the corresponding Markov chain. Okay, so these are all the, is there some power, am I not breaking the uh, motor? Okay, so this is just, you know, a very gentle definition of, uh, you know, to the problem. Now, um, you know, there are, there, are, there are a few other, maybe I should actually write this uh, in here. So other, other occurrences of the discrete Gaussian free field that you find in the literature. So one of them is that if you study the Langevin dynamics on, uh, you know, random surfaces, okay? so. In, in, with this particular definition, if you start modifying this, you get a larger class of random fields, which are, which are called the gradient models, where instead of the, with the square, you write the general potential in here. And you can study the dynamics of these as well. Where, uh, so let me write the dynamics only for the, for the Gaussian tree field. Let me write it in the H language. So I'll have a function of x as a function of p, and then I'll have a minus Laplacian of h. Uh, uh, at x, at t dt, a uh, plus square root of 2 dB uh, x uh, t, okay, like this. So I write the t's to remind you that everything depends on t. So this is a, this is a family of coupled stochastic differential equations for all x, for all x in d, and then of course you take uh, h equals h bar uh, on uh, d complement, okay? So if you take these equations, then, uh, then, you know, so then, then this, this dynamics has two effects. Of course, these are independent standard boundary motions. So they tend to make the, uh, the, the, the values at each vertex uh, independent of the other and kind of make the field very rough, okay? Because two Brownian motions will, you know, gradually separate by more and more. This, on the other hand, tends to equalize the fields because if, if you're at a point where you're smaller than the neighbors, then the Laplacian is positive. Okay, so the, then the, uh, uh, I guess there is a plus sign then. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it depends how you define the Laplacian, which I haven't done yet, so I still have the liberty of changing my mind. Uh, but if you take, so let me uh, define it here, okay? So I want the sum over all y, which are, and I put one over 2D in here. So the one over 2D should be the reflection of this, most of this factor in here, okay? And so if I write, so then this Laplacian tends to push this value towards the mean, and so that tends to equalize, you know, this is minimized on the configurations where, where uh, the, um, the, the, the function is harmonic, okay, which is sort of locally linear. And, and the coupled effect of these equations, of these, of these two things, is that there is an equilibrium measure, and the equilibrium measure is exactly this bit measure. Okay, so then uh, mu uh, d h bar is the stationary and reversible uh, measure uh, for the Langevin dynamics in here. Okay, so that's another way to uh, simulate, in fact, the Gaussian tree field. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, so that, that's where all these things appear. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the original, and so when you talk to physicists about Gaussian free field, they'll say, oh yeah, this is trivial, okay? 
Why is it trivial? Because it's a Gaussian, uh, because it's a Gaussian model. So all cal calculations of all basic covariance functions are uh, readily available. And uh, you know, for, for the perspective of interacting field theory, this is this is a trivial case. Okay. Now, I guess what happened in the last 15 years in probability was that mathematicians proved the physicists wrong. There is a lot of interesting effects that the physicists have overlooked, and it requires you to talk about the pathwise pathwise properties, and which are not visible in the in, in at the level of the covariance of the co correlation function. Okay, so this is uh, you know this is the introduction. All right, so let me now move on to some uh, some observations. want to make so sure okay so the so the d equals one case is actually easy even for mathematicians okay so let me uh, no, notice that so if you look at you know so let d you know d in this case let me take it to be an interval so from minus n to n intersect z so let me take it to be that set then of course this is this has only two boundary values and if I look at the diff and then the measure is the sum of the differences over the nearest neighbor squared, okay? So then, then if I look at the values xh minus xh minus 1 for x running from, I guess, n minus n all the way up to n, these are iid normals with mean zero variance, I guess, uh, if these 1, then I get a cross, I get a half, uh, conditioned on the total sum of these uh, to be the value at, uh, I guess, minus n minus 1, uh, sorry, plus n plus 1 minus h bar of n minus n minus 1, okay? So if I did not have, if these values did not have to add up to the boundary values, if one of my boundary values was, you know, left uh, to fluctuate, then these would be honest independent random variables. Otherwise, they are just conditioned on this value. Okay, so this is the Gaussian random walk conditioned to uh, visit two points. So this is the random walk bridge. So the configuration is, uh, is a random walk. It's a random walk bridge. Okay, so the, the picture that you have in there is that you have two values in here. Then, you know, there's some, uh, there's some linear asymptotics. And then around this, you have this Gaussian random walk. And since you know this has all moments, uh, well, we can uh, we can prove essentially a full asymptotic. So the scaling limit of this, uh, if I scale the and space and time uh, space diffusive space and time diffusively, is uh, is the owner on honest Brownian bridge, and so the configuration will fluctuate around the linear asymptotics by quantities of order square root of n. Okay, if this is. And in particular, if you're interested in the laws of the maximum, then the maximum will be of order, I mean, even if you put zero boundary condition, the maximum will be of order square root of n, and it will be distributed as the maximum of the Brownian motion, which is, a, which is essentially a positive, uh, the absolute value of a normal random variable. Okay, so, so all of these things we, we know. So the, the d equals to one case is actually not that, uh, not that hard. Now, if I look at the larger equal than three, then, uh, then uh, the, the fact that the re simple random walk uh, is transient implies, or is equivalent in fact to, that the green function, so the green function at, at a single point xx, that's just by the fact that, uh, you know, the formula, if I, if I increase the d, then of course the hitting time of that larger set will be larger than the hitting time of a smaller set. This is bounded by the green function of the whole uh, of the whole lattice, and then in three and higher dimensions, this is uh, this is uh, finite. I'm sorry. What is? Oh, transient. Yeah, yeah. Transient means that the probability that you know. So, so the, the in fact, what this tells you is that this is this tells you that the expected number of times a random walk started from zero expect the number of times it returns to zero is finite. And so it tells you that, in fact, the probability that it returns infinitely many times is zero. And that's the definition of transient, okay? And it's enough to characterize it in terms of the expected uh, number of times, okay? 
So the transience of the simple random walk implies that the green function is uniformly bounded in X by this property. And so that tells you that the, uh, the random variables, these Gaussian random variables, regardless of the mean, the, the variance will be bounded. So this tells you that this is the variance of HX. Okay. So what it tells you is that if I take a larger and larger Ds, if I sort of attempt to pr uh, perform what physicists would call the thermodynamic limit, or mathematical physicists, then the, these fields are tight in that, uh, in that asymptotics, which means that uh, subsequential limits are possible. Okay? So, so this means that the family of random variables, uh, uh, you know, in D, where D is a subset of uh, ZD finite, uh, is tight. And so you can study the, the laws of the distribution in the limit where D goes to infinity. And that law exists. And so, in fact, uh, the, uh, the law, uh, let, just, let me put zero boundary conditions to make things nice, uh, converges as D uh, you know, goes up to ZD uh, to, some, uh, to some law on, uh, on, on, Gaussian, on Gaussian random variables in the whole, in the whole space. This is a non-degenerate law. And, and just, you know, because we're talking about Gaussian random variables, it's enough to characterize the limiting covariance. So this would be mean zero, and the covariance of hx, hy, will be just the green function in z from x to y. And for that, in fact, you can write a formula. And uh, let me not write the formula. But uh, you can just invert the Laplacian. You can just solve the equation. Right? You solve the equation that minus the Laplacian on gx dot equals delta x. You solve this equation using Fourier analysis, and that's the, you know, that gives you the, the formula for that. Okay, so, there, so the point is that when I take d large, I can represent the d large by sort of infinite d by taking the whole lattice, and that, you know, for that I already have, uh, have a random field. So this field is, you know, it's, it's in fact will be stationary if I choose the, random, the boundary condition to be zero. It will be translation invariant. It will be ergodic. It will be tight. The largest, uh, the typical values will be of order unity. The largest, the, uh, the, the fluctuations, the largest value in a box will be of size logarithm uh, of n. And you know, somehow the, the, the ordinary asymptotics of just uh, independent Gaussians is, you know, everything is kind of commensurate with them. Regard, uh, nevertheless, this is still a uh, you know, very highly correlated random field. And so there are, there are still questions that you can look at, and I'll, I'll mention those questions uh, in a moment. So, but in a sense, uh, this case is for, for you know for the study of the uh, you know of, of interesting properties that happen you know in, in finite volume. This is kind of trivial. Okay, so now let me look at the case d equals to two. So, in the case d equals to two, we um, we have the following asymptotic. So let me actually write it for a specific case where Vn is uh, minus n over 2, uh, n over 2 squared intersect with Z2. So this is a box of size n in Z2 centered at the origin. Then, uh, then the fact is that the green function in this box at value 0, 0 is equal. So maybe let me write it as a lemma because I'm going to. Uh, that as your homework for you, is that you can write it, I'm going to use a notation that I'll keep using throughout, is that it's equal to uh, a constant times log n, and that constant is uh, 2 over pi for the specific normalization that I have. Okay? And the big O notation means that this quantity remains bounded in the limit as tends and tends to infinity. Okay? And the proof of this There's another homework assignment for you. And, uh, and again, you know, it's an, it, it's, a, it's an illustrative calculation. There are many ways to prove this. But if you want a, you know, a quick access to sharp asymptotics, I would, I would suggest diagonalizing the Laplacian in a square box. Okay? And that you can do because the, the, the eigenfunctions have a product structure. You just take cosines and sines with appropriate, um, uh, you know, with appropriate uh, constants in them. And uh, you know, that's Essentially, if I look at the values of zeros, the sines go, because the sine will always give me zero. So I just get the cosines. 
And so this gives me a bunch of uh, eigenfunctions, uh, eigenvalues that I have to uh, that I have to account for. And those are all explicitly computable. So this uh, this, this this formula, in fact, comes up of, comes out of an integral. Okay, so this is uh, you know this is one important thing. But you know we we, we wanna we may want to go beyond that. And uh, again, I'll remind you. So do I have to use the German way of erasing the board? <laughs> I guess I should, right? It will be the. <laughs> that's a very polite way of putting it. <laughs> Let me try to uh, do this. One disadvantage, and this is I didn't realize, that all these talks will get soggy. <laughs> and that's not what we want. Or broken. Not that matter. Okay, so this is, you know, this is one calculation that one should do. Uh, you know, there is, of course, the reason why you get a logarithm comes from, uh, you know, comes essentially, and, and, you know, all of this comes from a scale invariant property of the Laplacian in two dimensions, uh, and also the scale invariant property of the Brownian motion in two dimensions. Okay, because in order to see how many, you know, so in order to find the number of returns to the origin, you have to, you can sort of partition your box into concentric annuli and essentially account for the returns with respect to the hitting exit times from the various annuli, okay? And you will see that, you know, the, the, the analyst crossing probability, sort of the, if, if I look at the, uh, you know, if I look at a box and a box of, of a half size and a box of quarter size embedded inside, and I start the random walk on the boundary of box uh, of size, uh, you know, of the middle part, then the probability of hitting, exiting outside is commensurate with the probability of exiting inside, okay? So you have essentially, and, and that's regardless of the size of the box. And this property, you know, is, is the reason why the logarithm all, all appears. But if you want to have an explicit constant, then you better do some more explicit calculation than just that. Okay. So a potential theory uh, of the two-dimensional simple random walk actually tells you, and this, you know, this goes back to... Uh, to the book by Spitzer, for instance, he, uh, he writes it very explicitly, is that if I look at the green function at box Bn, and I look at the value at zero minus the value at uh, x, okay, so this is the expected number of returns to zero, and this is an expected number of returns to x. And x is some fixed, fixed, then this converges as n tends to infinity, to a function which only depends on x. So the limit exists and it only depends on x. And and A solves the uh, the problem is where you the Laplacian on A is equal to the delta zero uh, in Z D in Z two and A zero equals zero. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the solution. That's the uh, asymptotics. If we, if I want to know the off-diagonal part of this green function, then I can in fact uh, use the asymptotics from here and the fact from a potential theory that the difference of these two things, you know, uh, uh, converges to a to a to a function. Okay? And in fact, this solution allows you, you know. So let me write this down. Uh, write down this uh, this integral. So you can write this as a. You can actually write an explicit form for this. Uh, sine squared uh, k1. Okay, so this is uh, this is the formula that you get, and the integral is of say zero to two pi or minus pi pi uh, squared. 
Okay, so this this is this is a formula that you know I'm putting in parentheses. That's what you get when you if you analyze these two functions using Fourier analysis, this will be the outcome of that. Okay, so this tells you notably that this is also positive. So, so somehow returning back to zero is easier, is more is more likely than returning to any other point. Okay, so, so uh, you know, what's important is that when I take this formula, I can do some asymptotic analysis, and this has, in fact, now been done in, in many cases, and the asymptotic analysis in two dimensions for these, uh, for these you know, class of walks with uh, square integrable moments always gives you a form that, that there is a constant that multiplies a log x, then there is some uh, numerical constant, and then there are quantities which vanish as, as uh, n tends to infinity, as x goes to infinity. In fact, it's known that the second, the correction term is one over the distance squared. Okay, so it's something which is uh, finite, which goes to zero, but it's not quite summable on x. Or anything like that. Okay, so so that's that's what's important is that there is also the logarithmic dependence of this quantity. Well, it's not surprising. This is the uh, this you know in 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 you know, this is the green function ch at in the in z2 with the point zero taken taken out. Okay, so the uh, a of x is actually the green function at z2 uh, uh, right x x uh, minus zero. Okay, so it's the expected number of returns uh, for the simple n walk before it hits zero. And since the random walk in two dimension is recurrent, it hits every point with probability one, and so this expected number will be, fi will be finite. But the further you go, the, 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 more, the more it takes, okay? So this is, uh, you know, this is another, you know, another formula that I wanted to have. So, so when I put these two formulas in perspective, then what I get is that the g of vn of, uh, of xy you know, so I'm going to sort of pretend that, you know, g of vn of xx also has this asymptotic, and that's true. So when you put these formulas together, then you get a formula of the form uh, plus quantities of worrying distance. And this is in the limit where n is much larger uh, than x minus y, which is much larger than 1, and xy, and I should write it also in here. Well, write it in the end, x, y, deep inside. Okay, so this is, this is the asymptotic, and you can, you can use uh, estimates uh, to, to prove this, okay? So the green function has a very interesting behavior in two dimensions because it has, uh, you know, it has the property that this logarithm of the ratio appears. So if I take two vertices which are distance of order n, okay, then this is of order n, that is of order n, so this is uh, of order unity, okay? And if I take two vertices which are distance of order n to the alpha, then this is a log of n over n to the alpha, so this gives me like alpha, one minus alpha times log n, okay? And uh, in particular, if I use this formula, so then if I look at the, the situation in a box of size 2vn, or 2x and 2y, then this becomes g of vn of xy plus a little o of one. Okay, so again, this, none of these follow exactly one from the other. You have to do some work to actually check these, uh, check the asymptotics, but these are, these, are, these are true statements. Okay, so this tells me that, so, so what, you know, what does this tell me? So if I draw a box in, in the square, uh, a square in the, in the plane, then I can uh, put the lattice on it. And I can put a lattice such that this becomes a box of size n by n, or I can put a box which, which becomes a box of size 2n by 2n. If I pick two points in the original square, then when I go from the box of size n to box of size 2n, the coordinates of these have to be multiplied by 2. And that's exactly what you see in here, is that the covariance of these two fields uh, at the values 2x and 2y in the box of size 2n is the same asymptotically as the covariance of the, of the situation with the boxes of size n. So this is a statement of an asymptotic scale invariance. Okay. 
But there is even more. And that comes from the, from the fact that the, this is a Euclidean distance. Okay? And Euclidean distance is generally invariant under rotations. And so not only will the field have asymptotically in the limit and tends to infinity scale invariance, but it will also have a rotation invariance. And if you take scale invariance and rotation invariance locally, it builds into conformal invariance. So that's the statement I would like to make uh, in here. Yes, so this is a lemma. Okay, which again, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have you prove this. So let f be a function, so let D, so let me now change the notation slightly, so let D be a subset of the complex plane, be open, uh, bounded, uh, okay, simply connected, I don't need, but let's just leave it like that, okay, and uh, let F be a function which is C infinity with compact support on D, okay? and define h epsilon of f to be the integral of f of x, h of uh, x over epsilon, dx over d. Okay, so what I do is that I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, this will be, a, this is a Gaussian field. Uh, it will be a field, okay, maybe I should write, where uh, h, uh, is uh, the discrete Gaussian free field uh, in the domain d epsilon, just erase this, okay, which is the set of all points in the lattice such that x uh, epsilon lies in d. Okay, so I take I take a nice set in the in in the complex plane. I uh, open and I take the set of all points such that their epsilon uh, scaling uh, lies in that set. So you know, uh, so what it means is that I put a lattice over the set with the, the nearest neighbors on the lattice being of size epsilon, being distance of size epsilon. Okay. Now I sample the discrete Gaussian free field in the epsilon. Let me put zero boundary condition just for the def you know just for making it simple. The statement is then then h epsilon of f converges in law as epsilon goes to zero to a normal random variable with mean zero and the covariance which is f and let me write it in this form minus Laplacian minus one on d on f. Okay. So I take I take the I take this field I project it onto the corresponding uh, onto the corresponding function. So I take a linear functional defined by this function and by this random field, because this is a linear function in H. This also has a Gaussian distribution. So it will not surprise you that the distribution of this in the limit is also Gaussian. What is interesting is that we can write an explicit form of the covariance, and the explicit form is the quadratic is this sort of Dirichlet form associated with the, with the, uh, is the H minus one Dirichlet form, okay? Associated with the, uh, with the uh, uh, negative of the Laplacian. Actually, the way you prove this is that you look at Fs, which, which themselves are Laplacians of functions, and then this becomes an honest Dirichlet form. This is how you prove it. And again, this is a calculation for you to check in the homework, because, you know, I've told you everything that you need to know for this. So if you know enough about uh, random walks, you should be able to, uh, to verify that. Okay. No, no, no. It's a Dirac. So this is a function. So this means that delta Uh, am I, uh, ah, uh, let's see, so, this, for, this formula is not right, uh, 
just let me check things. No, this this formula is not quite right. No, ignore ignore this formula. I uh, I, I wanted to link this to. Uh, there, there is a relation to this green function, but it's actually slightly more complicated. I might bring this up at the uh, at the very end of the game, uh, but uh, but you know, but this this is a correct formula. Okay, so basically, what you do is that you s you solve this you solve this problem, and then you adjust the value at at one vertex because this problem only solves the function up to a constant model, uh, up, up to a constant. Okay, and in fact, if you want, then you know, here is another. Uh, is another formula that does that, and there is a relation to the green function in the punctured uh, in the punctured plane where I remove the origin uh, from the lattice, but uh, it's not so simple. Okay. okay, so that's uh, that's the oh, that's the point. So so. Uh, you know, again, this is a calculation that you you know you can do, um, because as I said, you know, the, the way to do this is to actually write f as uh, as a Laplacian of uh, of a function, and uh, and then uh, you know you know write the covariance of these h's in the in the specific domain, and then somehow use the fact that f can be uh, you know it, it can, the Laplacian can be inverted on f to uh, to, to write that explicit. Essentially, what you want—I mean, the singular operator is hard to deal with—but once you work with uh, functions which are themselves Laplacians, then you essentially remove this minus one, and it's about convergence of the corresponding Dirichlet forms. And that's uh, that's something that's not. I'm sorry. Gradient should be enough, but it's enough, you know. So, so, uh, so the point. Is yeah, I should, you know, I should. Uh, you know, I assume this thing, but you know what will help you is that you can, you can also set this to be zero, and once you set that to be zero, then uh, then you can invert the Laplacian of this function. Yeah, it's enough to invert this gradient, I agree. But then, uh, Okay, and a consequence of this fact is that the uh, that the field evaluated on such functions is in fact conformal invariant. Okay, and that has to do with the uh, with the you know, with the conformal invariance of these properties. Okay, so it turns out that if I that if I look at the let me not state this formally. So if I look instead of a function f, I look at I look at a conformal bijections of a domain into itself onto itself using some conformal map. And I look at the f composed with this map, then the law of this h epsilon on that f will be equal to the h epsilon law on the uh, the other function. Okay. So, so that that essentially is the uh, you know is the statement of the conformal invariant. So so the conclusion. So so in fact, uh, the uh, the asymptotic law is conformally. Uh, is conformally invariant. And I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I will not go into this for quite a while because I'll actually never need this particular statement. Now, notice that the asymptotic law is not the law on paths, but the law of these projections. You integrate, you integrate the, the random Gaussian function against, uh, against a smooth function. So you, you might ask, you know, is there in fact a pathwise realization of this? And the answer is no. That comes from the fact that the green function, this was on the board which I already raised, so you can look it up there. If I, if I take the diagonal of, uh, value of the green function, that it's g log n. So the variance of an individual hx 
diverges a sentence to infinity, and there's no way to ascribe the meaning to that. Okay? So this law only exists as an asymptotic law on some linear space of functions, which is sort of the closure of the space of, the con of these uh, C infinity compactly supported functions with respect to some natural, uh, natural norm on them. Okay? Sorry, with respect to this, this particular norm. So on that, on that space, you can define the asymptotic law of the Gaussian free field, and it has the conformal invariant property, but you cannot really talk about values at a point. Okay? All right, so I want to, uh, you know, I want to move to uh, level sets uh, description. Okay, so if you so if you want to talk about uh, the, the 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 configuration property for any of these Gaussian laws, you might also look at the you know look at the level sets. Just look at think of the configuration as sort of a terrain, and look at the level lines of the terrain and see what these look like. Okay, so in the case d larger than three, this is in fact still quite an interesting problem. So if I take the discrete Gaussian uh, free field on on Z d. Uh, with, with mean zero, okay, then uh, you can still look at, so you know, this will be probably the last time I'll talk about high dimensions, so let me uh, do this here. So I can look at the set of values where hx is larger than some alpha. Okay, so this is the alpha level set. And the question that you may ask, uh, for what alpha does this contain an infinite connected component. Okay, so this is some set of vertices. Two vertices are considered neighbors if they are neighbors in the lattice. So if I look at this set, okay, so of course there'll be many, many vertices which will be isolated or many finite components. But the question is, is there an infinite component at all? And so this, this question, in fact, is now occupying the minds of many people around uh, Alan Snitman, because he's sort of the one that started these questions. It's also related to the random interlacements, which is another uh, field that we studied. I think the currently uh, known, so, so, you know, so if you define the alpha C to be the infimum of alpha, where the answer is yes, Okay, the answer is yes with probability zero or one. This is a zero one event because it's a translation invariant event and this, uh, the, the corresponding measure is ergodic. Okay, and so if you take the infimum of alpha, so it's known that alpha C is larger or equal than zero. But it's not known whether it is zero or whether it's positive. You know, some more information is known in high dimensions. So this is, uh, so alpha C equals zero or not uh, is open. Uh, it's the supremum, right? Because I, uh, yeah, I want alpha C to be positive. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So the question is, you know, if you truncate the f the and then you know, then you have a two-sided question. So you can take fields, you can take a level set between minus alpha and alpha, and ask what for what alpha is it going to uh, is it is it going to contain an infinite component? And again, the, uh, the answer to this is not known in general. Okay. So this is an interesting field of study. And then, you know, I would just, uh, and uh, I guess Rodriguez, there are many people that work on this. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is the, the level set questions. And then of course, you know, once you're in there, once you uh, answer this question, then you can try to rehash the whole uh, theory of the nearest neighbor percolation on this. Now, the, the main difference here is that even though the field is stationary and it's sort of, you know, and it's tight in the limit, it's still heavily correlated. So the, uh, the, the correlation between points at distance x and y decay as a power of the, of the distance. And so none of the standard techniques uh, that are applicable will apply. Okay. So in D equals 2, you can, uh, you know, you can first ask the question uh, of the uh, zero one level set. So... Okay. 
Okay, so so again, you so O one means that you know this sort of question. So so uh, I'll formulate a specific theorem that that Schramm and Sheffield prove. So this is you know the work of Leto that Schramm and Scott Sheffield. In fact, then it's pretty much just Scott's. Uh, uh, it's pretty much the uh, the you know the, I guess the the, the, the the very important contribution of Scott into this field is that he sort of brought the Gaussian free field into the limelight of probability because uh, it was considered to be trivial and kind of not not really noticed uh, significantly. Okay, so the theorem is as follows: is that if I take a sequence, so if I take a sequence of domains, so D n is the sequence of uh, domains uh, in uh, the triangle lattice, uh, with a scale one over n. Okay, so so the idea is that you take a, that you take some domain in the complex plane, and you triangulate it using the triangle lattice like this. So these two are easy, and now you know one has to sort of make sure that. Okay, you can imagine. Okay, so I triangulate it like this, and suppose that I take a, you know, I take a fixed domain and I keep triangulate it so that the scale is one over n, and then what you do is that you look at a Gaussian free field, so you look at two marked points on here, so let's just call this a and b. I have two marked points, and I put two different bound, I put the boundary value equal to one constant over here, and another constant over here. Okay, so the value is some minus lambda in here and some lambda in here. Okay, so so the mean of the and I'll look at a Gaussian free field on this lattice. So this is not exactly the setting I had before, but the statement is on the triangle restriction. If I look at a Gaussian free field, the mean will be the 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 harmonic function which interpolates between these values. Okay. So somewhere there will be a, you know there will be a part where you know where uh, this goes from negative to positive value. Just think of lambda as positive. Okay. However, that also works coordinate-wise. If I take any sample of the field, I know that the values over here are positive and the values over here are negative. So I can just go uh, one vertex after another, and I can uh, you know so 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 this you know I can go between the vertices and I can sort of start to draw a line. Which tells me the the, the 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 distinction between the points where I see positive and negative values. Okay, now I'm drawing it sort of slightly boring, so you know essentially it will come up something like that. So I end up to draw uh, some curve that separates the the positive values and negative values. There are many curves like this, but all the other curves are closed, and this is the only open curve which starts at these boundary points. Okay, so let gamma n be the curve, the discrete curve, separating, connecting the two mark, mark points, A to B. Okay, so that's the curve gamma in there. And then the theorem of Schramm and Sheffield is that this curve, in fact, has a scaling limit. So as n tends to infinity, the law of this curve uh, can be described. So, but, you know, only for, you know, it becomes simple for, for particular values of lambda. So there are, there is lambda positive such that gamma n scales in law as n tends to infinity to one of the schramm leibniz processes, and this is the one that you get is SL4. Okay, and it's an SLE4 in the uh, in the uh, in, in the Kinsinger domain. Yeah. Yes, on one particular lambda. If you choose other lambdas, then the limit still exists, but it's not SLE4. It's one of the SLE kappa rho processes where kappa is four and rho is non-zero. Okay. So so the sta the statement is for a specific lambda. And in fact, when you look at samples of configurations, you see that there is in fact some kind of a barrier that runs along this curve, okay? The values of the field, if you sort of color code it, this, you should look up these papers because these are very nice. 
I mean, if I was, you know, projecting this on a board, I would show you these pictures. If you color code the values, you know, negative values to be more black and the, the, the more positive values to be white, you see that, that the part to the left of the curve is significantly darker than the, the part to the right of the curve. So, you know, it, somehow you can think of this as, you know, being some kind of a wall that runs through the configuration, okay? Even though that's not quite, uh, not quite what. So this is the manifestation of conformal invariance at the level of the paths, okay? So this is a manifestation of conformal invariance at the level, at sample paths, at level of sample paths. Okay? Now, of course, I told you that sample paths as functions don't exist. So there's nothing like taking the continuum Gaussian free field and uh, identifying the level sets running through it. The best thing you can do in this case is that you can, in fact, do the following. You can take, you can take an SLE kappa row curve and you put a boundary value minus lambda on the left side and plus lambda on the right side. You consider a Gaussian free field left of it, an independent copy of a Gaussian free field to the right of it. And now you take the joint law of all of these but you stop looking at the SLE4 curve. And what you see, you know, once you integrate out over the, uh, the, 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 the curve, you see a Gaussian free field in the whole domain. Okay, so there is a way to introduce a coupling of the continuum Gaussian free field in the left part and right part through this random SLE curve that jointly gives you the law of the, uh, of the Gaussian free field in the whole domain, okay? But again, only in the sense of projection onto the space of uh, nice and smooth functions. So this is the uh, this is the level set asymptotic for the O1 level set. Okay. So so now I would like to you know so our goal. So now I'm actually getting to really the subject of the lectures, is to understand the so so what we see is that the conformal invariance shows up here even though the object is really not uh, you know tangible for the, for that sort of questions. So do the same. Uh, for uh, the extreme values. Of H. Okay. So what I like to do is I like to look at say for instance the maximum and show you that the maximum admits a description which encodes conformal invariance in, in some in some way. Well for that I'll first have to let's see I'm about an hour right through. Okay, so let me actually, uh, if this is not a bad time to, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up the questions that I'll, uh, that I'll do. And I, uh, Okay, so, so we kind of moving to the Okay. So so here is uh, you know so so you know the question one is what's the scale of the Okay, so how does this maximum scale? And the answer to this is a theorem of uh, Boltzhausen Jacobin and uh, Deutschel is that this maximum as, uh, as n tends to infinity scales like two square root of g log n. Okay, so the maximum itself will scale like a logarithmic function. Okay, and uh, I'll show you at least, you know, there's a simple argument for the upper bound, which, uh, you know, gives you the, the, the correct upper bound term, but then incorrect uh, second order term. And then, you know, if I, in fact, understanding the second order term is key in, in, this, in this business. And then, 
And then the question is, what's the structure of the set uh, x in Vn such that hx is uh, larger than uh, uh, than the value, you know, than uh, the maximum. Let me write it in this form, even though I'll formulate it slightly different, minus uh, a constant. Okay, is there such a description? And uh, the question is, what alpha? What alpha? How to scale alpha? Do I have to, so if I look at the maximum and I look at the set of values which are below the maximum, how do I need to scale alpha to get anything interesting? And the somewhat surprising answer is that you only need to scale alpha to be of order unity. Okay? Now, this is not the case if you take ID random variables. If you take ID normals and you look at the maximum value, if you look at you know, 0 0.1 below the maximum value, you will have tons of uh, what? Yeah, you mean the. You mean that the, if I take them of the variance, yeah, okay. But if I take them to be variance one, then of course, then there is a. Yeah. You mean if I take them to be the same variance? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah. So the you know so the question is what sort of interval do I need to take and that's you know so then and then uh, what's the structure what's the geometry of this set okay so the question is you know how are the points in this set distributed uh, you know is there some qualitative description that will tell you you know how they are how far they are apart okay so it turns out so you know so that's essentially what Anton says is it turns out that at some level of coarseness this looks very much like the situation for independent random variables, okay? Yet the correlations, of course, prevent you from proving anything using the methods of independent random variables because, because if the fields are, if you take two points which are distance n in a box of size n, then these two fields are almost independent of each other, but if they are anything closer than that, then, the, then there's a strong dependence between them. And overcoming the strong dependence is really the key. So I'll show you how to answer all of these questions, and in fact, how, the, that, how to show you that, that, well, not this set, but how conformal invariance, in fact, enters in this picture. So, okay. But that will be tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so it's a, it's, it's SLE4 is a family, so in this context, just think of a domain. So SLE4, which will be the chordal version, is a family of curves between A and B, okay? Uh, which have the property, so they are random, so there's a, ran, there's a law on continuous curves like this, okay? And the law has, uh, you know, this does not define the law completely, but it has the property that it's uh, conformal invariant, so that if I take any, uh, any uh, conformal bijection of the domain onto itself, which preserves these two points, there's a one parameter family, it preserves the law. And it has the property that if I erase part of the curve, okay, up to this point, if I look at up to this point, then I get a curve, then, then what I have is that I condition on this part of the curve, so then I get a new, yeah, you are obstructing. <laughs> I think you're still obstructing. <laughs> uh, if I look at this curve conditional on this part, the law of the curve that follows in here is the SLE4 in the conformal image of the domain where this has been mapped to the original one, where I have removed this part by mapping it and this becomes the new at this point, okay? So the SLE curves are characterized, so the first property is conformal invariant. The second property is what's called the conformal Markov property. That if I condition on the part of the curve, what I see uh, in the remainder is an SLE in the corresponding reduced domain, okay? 
And of course, the conformal invariance allows me to go between one doma domain and another, a simply connected domain. Okay, and th then there is one parameter family of curves like this you have, and when you set that parameter to four, you get SLE four. Right, so there is also a differential equation description. There's many ways to characterize this, but this is this is Schrumpf's theorem, which said that if you have a curve of this property. <laughs> So the difference between Brownian motion and SLE is SLE is a simple curve, in, at least for kappa less than four, whereas Brownian motion intersects itself. Okay, so so you have to assume that the curve is simple, or it at least it's you know it never intersects itself. So that's the problem. And it's it's the discovery of that, of that Schramm, and in fact there was a, like a 10-year or 15-year effort to prove that various uh, you know various random curves in two dimensions have an SLE limit. So one of them would be that if you take actually a Brownian motion between two points, and then you know that sweeps some domain, and you look at the uh, left boundary of that domain. So that left boundary of the domain is SLE eight thirds, is the Mandelbrot conjecture. So that's one of these curves. I wouldn't mind hearing some feedback, you know, how, how deep you want me to go into various things. So, you know, I decided this lecture to be kind of overview because I wanted to, well, I want to look, I want to see a look in your face after the lecture, <laughs> which already troubles me slightly. And I want to, uh, and I want to sort of make sure that, you know, we on for the next, uh, whatever, three times 75 minutes or, or 60 minutes. So, you know, I can adjust the pace. I can adjust the materials to tell you something that you can actually, uh, uh, you know, get in, 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 in that time. So you don't have to tell me now, you can tell me, you know, in <laughs> private, in, in, in the men's room, for instance, you know, if you're too shy to tell me in open yeah. public. <laughs>